Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends. I'm Beth Webster, Director of the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on the adoption of Industry 4.0 in small and medium sized enterprises. So before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet. And in my case, this is the land of the Rwandri from the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Just before we begin and before I introduce our um, esteemed panelists, I'd just like to make a few <coughs> housekeeping remarks. So could you, may I ask that you make sure you're on mute. Um, the presentation will be recorded and made available later. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, could you please write your questions in the Q&A box or at the end of the session, raise your hand and we can unmute you if you'd like to ask a question directly to one of the speakers. Now, Industry 4.0, what is it? Um, so it's regularly usually defined as being the combination of automation, data exchange, plus digital technologies. It encompasses things like artificial intelligence, big data, virtual reality, robots, smart production, connectivity, drones, 3D printing, algorithms, natural language processing, and machine learning. It will have and is having a profound uh, implication for how companies create and capture value. It is believed to be the next step in the efficient transformation of manufacturing, a process that will eventually see the world's manufacturing needs by being met by only a very small portion of the workforce, somewhat similar to the way in which mining and agriculture today meet all our needs with only a very small proportion of our workforce. However, for a single firm to make this transition, it's a big step and one that involves immersion in a different way of thinking. So with this in mind, both state and federal governments for some years have been putting funds into intermediate bodies, intermediary bodies such as the Factory of the Future at Swimmern to increase our understanding about what is involved, what are the opportunities and what are the problems. So with me today, I ha have managers from five small and medium sized enterprises who've participated in to varying degrees in this transition. So let me introduce them to you. First of all, I have Peter Angelico, who's the managing director from ABEC, which is a build, build to print manufacturer. And some of their products include safety rails, platforms and gratings. And Peter's also president of SEMA, which is the Southeast Melbourne Manufacturing Association. Uh, I have also have Mond Q, who's the manager of NACO Furniture. And NACO Furniture is a family run furniture and design firm. Thirdly, I have David Kaplan, who is manager of Sleep Corp, which is a home textile and medical device company. Uh, delivering, uh, he makes some of the products that you're probably familiar with, such as mattress protectors, uh, 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 pillow protectors, etc. Uh, uh, in addition, I have Brad Clark, who is a manager from Keech, and Keech is a family run firm making mining and industrial products. And finally, I have Nico Adams, who is a manager of the Factory of the Future. Um, and uh, no, sorry, I should say before Nico, Nico is not final. I also have Phil um, Butler, who is managing director of Textile Technologies, which is a health and hygiene products manufacturer. Um, so first of all, what I'd like to do is ask each of our five um, CEOs or managers to talk about what has been their experience uh, with their company making their transition to Industry 4.0. Uh, what have been the best aspects? What are the barriers? Why do they want to do it or why don't they want to do it? And um, what sort of uh, information or, or lessons can they give to the rest of us? So first of all, uh, let's hear from Peter. Okay, thanks Beth. Uh, just to give you a slight background, I'm a, the owner and founder of ABIC Group. We're a build the print component manufacturer. But uh, the main reason for being on this uh, presentation today is I'm president of the South East Melbourne Manufacturers Alliance. So we represent 200 odd manufacturing members, in the, mainly in the South East, but a few above and beyond that. Now, we've been hearing about Industry 4.0 for probably the last four or five years. And, and to be brutally honest, I haven't really taken a lot of notice of it uh, until yesterday when uh, Nico Adams gave a presentation. And it did open up my mind a little bit more to it, although I'm still quite skeptical about what it can or can't do. Um, in my mind, it's a bit too much of sort of top-down, uh, government-inspired, you know, 
Netflix tell manufacturers what they can do or how to do things. But I think um, yeah, manufacturing's got a, a lot of issues at the moment, but the good thing is that manufacturing is actually finally being talked about for the right reasons. Now, when was the last time you heard a positive story about manufacturing? It's all usually doom and gloom. So we know we have to get better at what we do. The fact that it's being talked about is great. And what we're asking is that uh, governments in particular open up their supply chains to give manufacturers the opportunity. Now, nothing happens until you sell something. And from that, all of these th things like Industry 4.0, all those sort of uh, initiatives and that are great, but the customer comes first. You can't do anything until you sell something. So a lot of this stuff tends to be, I think, the cart being put before the horse. We need to you know, get, the, get the customers, you know, go after those major projects, and then from that flows a lot of opportunities. And that's where some of the improvement will come from. Now, in my mind, you go back in history, okay, the first you know, industry 1.0, if you want to call it, was the Industrial Revolution. Then, of course, came uh, mass production and then computers and manufacturing in the sort of 70s and 80s. So I think 4.0 is more of a, a, it's a clever marketing term. I don't think it's a, a revolution as such. It's, it's more of, it's a bit like the, the quality assurance in the, you know, the 90s and that it's, it's a, to me, it's, again, it's, it creates a whole level of marketing and consulting, which doesn't necessarily help manufacturing again customers is what drives what we do so i think yes there's some opportunities there and if even if at the worst case it gets people to think about their business in a different way well that can only be a good thing but where we're coming from with SEMA is that we need opportunities at the moment manufacturing is about seven percent of gdp and that's both state and federal so we've set a goal and we want governments to embrace this as well let's get that up to ten percent by 2025 and then another five percent by 2035 if we do that unemployment will be solved and the, the value add you get from manufacturing is enormous you know the the, uh, the multiplier effect every manufacturing job has about a 4.7 uh, multiplier you know downstream in the economy you know we all like our coffee and that but really how many baristas do we need and i think that's where we've gone too much to the service economy you know if you make stuff that's where you can really build on on the uh, on the economy but as i said coming back to the 4.0 yes it's a it's a good tool to have at the back end but it's not going to drive our business forward. Customers and having access to projects is where it's really going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And then these other ideas and initiatives, yes, they can plug in and help if people need assistance with you know, with their marketing and their, you know, the way they, you know, da using data to you know, either make a better product or just you know, make sure they're looking after customers, better quality assurance, all those sorts of things. Yes, it can help, but it shouldn't be at the top end to say, and I think governments are sort of saying, well, you must do this, otherwise you're not going to be a manufacturer. Well, no, it doesn't really work like that. So, yeah, it's, it comes after the, uh, the customer. The customer is always first. So I might just leave it there because, again, I'm probably more the, you get brutal honesty for me, nothing less. Um, Fantastic. No, no. We're, we're, yeah, really, we're really here to hear from you. And so, you know, what you think is your experience and what you think are your priorities is absolutely uh, what we want to hear from. Uh, I'll now pass over to Mon Q. Um, Mon, do you want to just say a few words a bit more about what your business does and um, and then talk about your experience with Industry 4.0? Absolutely. Can you see my screen at the moment? I'm just sharing yeah. my screen. Yeah. I've just done a slight little like presentation just so I think the image says a thousand words. So I'll just go through it really quickly and just give you a demonstration of what we do and where we come from. So I'm basically the founder and um, owner of United Make, a uh, sort of multi-toy design sort of company based in Richmond, Victoria. Uh, so I come from a design background in architecture and I'm gonna go through the stuff that we do and also what we're looking at in manufacturing in Victoria as well. So we run a little workshop, um, manufacturing space, looking at virtual reality, laser cutting, CNC in the small little um, thing, a traditional furniture company. We look at speculative cities. We do artwork for Facebook out of 20,000 chopsticks. We manufacture installations out of laser cutting material. We look at recycled um, coffee grounds to make things. We do like stage sets for Harry Potter. Uh, we look at future furniture with um, big furniture companies as well. We also look at housing urban planning. We also make digital interfaces. Uh, we, I sort of teach in terms of the Architecture Association of London. And we recently actually released the Don't Pandemic book uh, during this time. So we've been keeping busy. Uh, but one of the projects that really is true to my heart is uh, Niagara Design. So this is a furniture-led uh, company that's family um, built uh, for my father. And basically, it's custom design furniture. So we do everything, you know, out of timber. So from desks to tables to wall units to, you know, bookcases to, you know, a little like 
areas inside the house where, you know, if you want something, we sit down and sort of sketch it for you from hand and we sort of take it to the factory and we sort of make it. And, you know, everything's quite old school. Everything's done by hand. Everything's done with a planer and a saw and everything's done like that. So coming into this business from the opposite spectrum where we do all this digital technology, I was very curious about how we can really push it into the 21st century. And one of the greatest things about, well, what is the future of these local bespoke furniture companies? And that's where we got in touch with sort of Swinburne 4.0. And really what, what was quite nice is they gave us sort of like a, you know, intro into it and, you know, did a SWOT analysis into what we were doing and how we could improve it. And of course, from that analysis, we had some feedback and what we could actually go. And for us, you know, the original process journey that we found and then after that, we sort of started adding these layers in. So I think it really gave us some insight into what we could really do when maybe we're not 4.0 ready yet, but it also pushed us forwards in a different way to really start thinking about what furniture could be and what we could keep it within Victoria. So these are some of the images and we're quite good at the digital layer. So these are actually renders. They actually aren't built. We actually do them as drawings. So we actually put out all these designs first. As um, we talked about with Peter, customer comes first, of course. So the customers can actually choose what they'd like before we go into manufacturing. So we can actually do a lot of those things at the front end. And that could actually feed back into the sort of back end. And of course, COVID was a very, very interesting time for us because we're a custom bespoke furniture company where people have to come in and draw out. So we actually started the um, website and Instagram during uh, COVID. And actually that's boosted up quite a lot. So if you have a look, we actually had 221,000 percent increase in our websites because we started doing all this stuff and trying to um, engage with the customers on a multi-channel on the channel level um, of course during the second lockdown it was very difficult for us because the furniture sector had to actually shut but nonetheless we kept the digital sort of aspect going and we sort of focused a little bit on the manufacturing side of things and now we're starting to standardize things starting to look at you know bombs and you know building materials and all that and this actually all happened because of the Swinburne sort of conversation and we're looking at you know how can we actually design things for the factory or how we can keep manufacturing in this country in a way in a sort of optimal way and we're sort of in this progress of like standardizing our range you know starting with a bit more lean methods and like design with co-machines understanding more materials and local materials and I guess we're, we're just continuously improving I know we're not there yet and I'm sure Nico would uh, smile at this but we're, we're Almost there. So we're, we're sort of continuously improving and we're hacking and borrowing and putting things up. And, um, you know, we've designed a working from home set during this time and we're just innovating, I guess, during this time. And I think one of the biggest things for us was just, you know, external perspectives on our business, helping us, you know, break through some of the things that maybe we, we're sort of in it and we can't really see and being able to maybe not look at the industry 4.0, but other manufacturing abilities and how we can actually deal with that. So um, on that note, um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and we can have a further discussion on that later on, but that's it for me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Uh, looks like something I'd really like to buy myself. Uh, David, uh, would you be able to, David's from Sleep Corp, as I mentioned, this is the home textile and medical device company. David, do you want to talk about your experience with Industry yes, 4.0? Sure, yes. So I'm the founder of Sleep Corp. We started 40 years ago. You'll pick up from my accent originally from South Africa. And uh, been in Australia now for 26 years and used Australia as a platform to build the company internationally. We invented the original first waterproof concept in mattress protection. But over the years, we worked at how we could actually get that product to be actually breathable and whisper quiet, machine washable and could be tumble dried. And we found out that we, there was actually an incredible need for it worldwide and built the business internationally. Um, and I sold the international arm about four year, five years ago and have kept the Australian and New Zealand operations to myself, but realized that the only way I'm going to remain competitive because we continue to manufacture here in Australia is how are we going to remain competitive and how can we do that? Because as we all know, the Australian wages are the highest in the world. How are we going to keep our factory operational? And fortuitously, I was already working with Swinburne where they were doing work for us with virtual uh, reality, uh, where they helped us design a, a, an anti-snoring product, which uh, we call Snorbigon. And they did a lot of work for us on that, which was very successful, where they developed it in the virtual reality laboratory, a product that we've got patented. Anyway, they then introduced me uh, to the IMCRC. And actually, that happened to, and I went to one of their future, the, the future map for us. And that was the first time that I heard anything about Industry 4.0. I had no idea and never heard of it until then. 
And it was explained quite simply to me there that we're effectively in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I think Peter mentioned something about that earlier. But to me, that was really a clever way to understand it, that we are in the area now where we're using robotics and automation in order to take ourselves into the future. And we already were looking at what can we do to keep our business competitive and how can we keep people employed in Australia? Because it's just becoming really difficult. And when we already been looking at that, and this just helped us really uh, progress this much faster. And in fact, we are now working with the IMCRC and again with Swinburne, they're helping us with IMCRC to actually work on developing our fully automated manufacturing plant as we speak. It's in progress and being developed. So we're very, very excited with it all. We've now found the right machinery. We're now busy doing the proper layouts and ultimately that will be done with a virtual reality by Swinburne. We have a number of their graduates helping us within the factory. So for us, it's very exciting from the point of view that all of the studies we've done already have shown us that this will help us keep our business um, very much competitive to be able to remain Australian made and also helps us look at being able to ultimately take it to the international market from Australian made products. So I'm sure you all will also recognize that Australia has seen specific, much more, there's a number of what we call uh, uh, green countries, those countries where we have free trade agreements with, where there's great opportunity. So Sleep Corp is now looking at doing a number of products that are sleep related. We're saying when you sleep well, you live well. So what we're doing is working on a number of sleep related products that we can manufacture in Australia. So I, I would say to, to me, there's absolutely no question that if you're going to remain a manufacturer, a, a manufacturing operation in Australia, there is no way to do it but to look at Industry 4.0 because you would have to, have to um, operate on a basis where you can modernize your business. Because if you try and do it in an old way and operate with old ways with the labor intensive business, you have absolutely no chance of being able to be competitive on a worldwide stage. So we are very excited about that, as I say, and it's certainly proving to us that it does work. And um, Swinburne has certainly been very instrumental in helping us uh, progress this. So we're very grateful for all of that. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions um, on that as well. But certainly highly recommend that anybody who's listening in on this, take this seriously if you're interested in taking your manufacturing business into the future. Thank you very much, David. Um, Brad, do you want to talk to us about your experience with Industry 4.0? Just to remind people, uh, Brad runs a mining and industrial products firm uh, up in Ballarat. You're on mute, Brad. Yeah, Bendigo, sorry. Beth. Bendigo, sorry. Yeah. yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, as Beth mentioned, we do a lot of work in the mining and industrial space. And just to, to put a bit of a, a backstory, I guess, we're a steel foundry. Um, so as a lot of people you know, are aware and, and Peter touched on, you know, the, the doom and gloom of you know, the manufacturing years gone by, foundries have not, uh, um, you know, missed out on, on them being impacted and, and a lot of foundries unfortunately have closed in Australia over the last number of years. Um, we did, a, we did a review several years ago where we sort of looked at our, our key competitors and the facts were that every single one of them had offshore manufacturing capabilities. Uh, there were very, very few who were manufacturing like-for-like -like parts in Australia. Um, so basically that raised a very simple question. Now, how will we continue to compete? Um, Keech is a third generation. 85, nearly 86 year old company. So there's there's quite a bit of history there and and certainly we weren't going to uh, you know, give up without a fight. So where did it, you know, how did our journey start? You know, we're, we're at the very, very beginning of our journey. Um, it started, you know, it's probably similar to David in that we, uh, I attended a uh, IMCRC discussion on um, Future Map and, and Factory of the Future about well, 18 months ago. And at about the same time, we identified that um, we would need to implement a new ERP and uh, manufacturing execution system into our business. Uh, the, the one that we had was outdated and certainly posed significant business risk. 
when we really looked at those two projects, it became very apparent that Industry 4.0 and, and an ERP system were very, very strategically aligned and, and really dovetailed nicely into you know, what we wanted to do as a business. Moving forward, um, that led to you know us being very very fortunate in that you know making applications for the manufacturing modernisation funds, um, which which led to you know helping us um, introduce the ERP system. We got that approved you know mid this year, um, which allowed us to head off down that path. Uh, late in 2019, we actually engaged with Swinburne for a Industry 4.0 readiness assessment. And, and again, it was very pleasing that um, you know, that assessment you know, pointed out a number of different areas that we could, we could integrate into the ERP system, you know, like data-driven decision-making, you know, equipment, you know, connectivity remotely, um, making KPIs more visual and, and, and all of that stuff we were able to specify into the new ERP system to ensure that um, we, we get the maximum benefit. Um, personally, yeah, the, the, we, we've gone through the readiness assessment with Swinburne. It was you know, an extremely user-friendly process. It was, it was cost-effective for our business. Um, after having to go through the process of apply for funding through, I guess, government funding and the necessary hoops and probity that's, a, that's attached to that, the um, going through Swinburne and, 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 and engaging them and getting that off the ground was very, very simple in comparison. Um, the, the team there were very helpful. It was, there, was, there was no hand-holding required to, to enable the team to, to uh, help us develop our frontline and uh, inexperienced probably middle management team. Um, you know, and, and then basically what that's allowed us to do, we've, we've, we've got a very clear strategy moving forward now, with, which is the, the two technology-based systems, i.e. the Industry 4.0 and, and the uh, ERP implementation, but out of the readiness assessment, we've also got some more of your traditional, um, you know, maybe lean, but still, you know, factory of the future type improvements with, you know, visual management workflow, uh, ergonomics, and that's enabling us to um, engage across a, a wider uh, spectrum of our workforce that, you know, that all of this isn't just pointed in at our, our IT department or all of it isn't pointed into the operational team. It's enabled us to, you know, go on this journey as a team. Fantastic, Brad. That's great. Uh, Phil. So, Phil, just to remind people, he's chairperson of Textor Technologies. I think the name's changed, has it, Phil? But it's a hygiene and medical products company. So, Phil, can you talk? <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, Beth, and uh, it's great to be a part of the Swinburne uh, group here. Um, look, I, I want to take a slightly different tack. Um, we've been uh, on this journey since 2002. Uh, we bought, uh, the family bought, uh, a cut, bought the business in 2000, and in 2002, we invested in a new production line for specifically for Kimberly Clark. And we made a decision in that when we were putting that new line in that we would put uh, Siemens gear all the way across on all of the control architecture. So it was a Siemens S5 unit. And that really taught us a lot about digital controls and things. So we've been on a journey since 2002. The most important thing I think we did though during that first production uh, uh, investment was that we went from a batch process to a continuous process. A very, very important point because when you get a continuous process, then you can use controls to get a lot more out of your machinery. Peter mentioned that uh, there's a lot of hype around Industry 4.2. There's a lot of words. Everyone's got a different opinion about it, what it means. But I'll just give you a little example. Um, we're developed from a small company into, I, I think you defined it as a, in the medium category now. 
Um, we export to about 21 countries around the world. We're even exporting into China, big volumes. We put in huge volumes of material in the, I don't know, maybe per annum, something like 300 million square meters of material goes around the world. Um, and right at the moment, um, we are totally sold out. So every single square meter of material we can make, we sell. Um, we're in the hygiene market. So of course, during the pandemic, you'd expect us to be in that position. But since the lockdown, we've been able to run the company remotely um, and we've been able to increase our turnover by 40%, right? We haven't missed a shipment to 21 countries around the world. We've been in all of our raw materials. Everything's been possible because of Industry 4.0. Now, what does Industry 4.0 mean? We are sure we've got robotics and sure we've got uh, the front end, the office end is fully digitized, the factory's fully digitized. Um, but the most important thing from 4.0, it gives us data, it gives us information, allows us to make decisions, it allows us to filter the information so that it can show our workforce, uh, the guys on the shop floor, it can show them what's going right, what's going wrong, where they need to focus their attention. So there's massive dashboards all over the place that literally cover every single aspect of our business. And uh, because of all that information, we can take decisions and we can drive the business forward. So um, have faith. I think I was talking to my IT guy this afternoon and uh, the most important thing is get started. You know, it's, a, it's a, a journey which is confusing for many people because of, I think sometimes this, uh, there is a little bit of hype about the whole thing, but it's really just about modern manufacture and modern manufacture is not labor intensive. Modern manufacture is capital intensive and it's technology intensive. That's it. And Industry 4.0 allows you to work your way through these issues and allows you to make correct decisions. So have faith is what I can say, have faith. Thanks, Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, Nico, would you like to talk about um, what you see from your experience, uh, looking at many people who've come through your program, what you see as being um, the experience most um, firms have been through, you know, what they valued, what they didn't value, what worked, what didn't work? Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk. Um, it's great. It's been great to hear from everybody because the spectrum of views that we've had is the spectrum of views that we encounter typically as we, as we work with industry. Um, Typically when companies come to us and say, hey, you know what, this industry for zero thing, what the hell is it? And I don't understand it. And how does it fit into my business? Um, we find that that view is due to a, to a number of factors. First and foremost, it's due to a view that industry for zero is about technology. When you ask people for a definition about industry for zero, they come up with very similar things like the, the, the definition that you provided at the beginning of the workshop. Industry for zero is about artificial intelligence. It's about the internet of things, it's about 3D printing, it's about cloud computing, cyber security, whatever have you. The trouble with the technology definition is that it doesn't actually articulate what it does for business and how it helps to create business outcomes. And that's causing an awful lot of confusion. Secondly, um, it is just a you know reality of, uh, reality of life that 90% of all manufacturing companies have 30 employees in less than Australia, so they're small. And typically everybody who works in the business works in the business and there's not that much time available to actually understand how new things that are coming down the pipeline, including technologies, actually can lead to shifts in value capture and creation. And that's the interesting thing about Industry 4.0. Right? You can use the technology to affect shifts in a way in which a business captures value and creates value. There's not much time to understand how that works and how to respond to it and how to and how to leverage it. So an approach that's an approach that's that's worked for us has just to simply uh, been to have a conversation with a business that started not from the technology end but from the business outcomes end. So when business comes to us and says, "Hey, this industry for zero thing, what is it?" We usually change the conversation to forget about that industry for zero thing for for a bit, tell us about what it is that you want to do next as a business. Where do you want to be? What's your North Star? And where do you want to get to? And then in the second conversation, we think about, we think about um, the value drivers into that. 
what do you need to put in place to create that value proposition that you're talking about there? And then in the third conversation, we probably think about how we use technology to deliver those value drivers that give you those business outcomes. And when we approach it from that end, what we're seeing is that number one, an awful lot of people kind of go, huh, but that's what I do as a business leader anyway. I think about the next set of business outcomes and the value drivers into that. And so the answer is, yeah, keep doing that. We'll help you with mapping the technology against that. And then the second thing is to also work with businesses to show that you can build this bottom up. It's not about making big bucks investment necessarily. You can create meaningful outcomes through bottom up innovation. Take a business like, and they're not, uh, not here today, like Sutton Tools, for example, um, a CNC machining shop, they uh, manufacture cutting tools through batch processes. By simply being able to connect an Arduino or a little microcontroller board to their CNC machines, they can and by simply being able through that, being able to tell whether the machine is on or off, they can make predictions about whether they're going to meet their production targets for that machine today. Um, and if they don't, what, you know, what, what you might do to mitigate that. And it comes back to what Philip was saying, is that Industry for Zero gives you data about your business that you can act on. And that then allows you to drive that data to that North Star that you've articulated. And so for us, really, it's that engagement journey, not to come in with the technology, but if it will be a business-led engineering facility and start from the business end, that's been successful. And that I would recommend to businesses as well. I'm the only bullshit in the room. I've never started a business. I've never run a business. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to run a manufacturing business, but we kind of see what works and what doesn't work because we interact with so many of them. And that seems to be a path that seems to work for a lot of businesses. So th thanks very much, Nico. Now, um, can I just ask people in the audience out there to send in a question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your computer. And while you're doing that, I'll just go around uh, our panelists again and just ask them to comment on the current programs that the government is offering either directly or through uh, an intermediary like a university or an industry group. What, what would, how, how would they improve those programs or are they perfect? Maybe Peter, we'll start with you again, just go through the same order. Yeah, look, I think part of the problem with those programs, they're, they're politically driven, they're not driven from what the customer wants. And even you read what's come out of the budget recently and all these other initiatives, you never ever see the word customer. And nothing happens to, as I said before, nothing happens to yourself something. So I think this is where the, the policy settings need to be tweaked. The idea is right and they, yes, they're trying to help, but I think they're, they're trying to help in the wrong ways. And again, picking winners, it, it's been proven over the last few decades. It just does not work. If you're going to do anything for industry, there's got to be across the board, whether it's through uh, accelerated depreciation, R&D, they're the sort of things that drive investment. Investment then drives employment. So this is where I think the policy settings are, are asked about, if I can put it like that. Fantastic. Mond, what would you change uh, or how can it be? programs being uh, improved? Uh, for us, I think one is the distribution information and how we get notified of it. Sometimes we just don't know, like the distribution channels for us. Secondly, it's like there's so much red tape and so much you know, legislation behind it that it takes forever to get something approved. And sometimes we need it now. We need more immediate feedback. And it feels like it gets stuck within bureaucracy for a long time uh, before anything is approved on, on our end. So in the end of the day, it's like we have to spend so much time just to write these grants or write these forms that at the end of the day, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> and is that the best use of our time? And sometimes we need to hire someone to write the grants for us. And usually they cost money as well because we don't know how to, you know, work, work the system or understand the system sometimes coming from, you know, small, small to medium sized businesses. So what is the best way to communicate to your group, your peer group? Uh, personally, uh, well, I, well, personally, I think there could be a bit more social channels that we can look at that, you know, we can have more of community groups, um, especially with, you know, our generation, I think in terms of Instagram and Facebook, they could be, yeah. social media could definitely help. Like, I don't think that would be um, a devastating thing. I think that could definitely help within our sort of categories. Uh, secondly, it's like, where, where, where do you point us to? Like, I think more industry focused things like this, you know, definitely really helps. Um, and this was just 
coming off from other people recommending it. Uh, and secondly, I think there could be a bit more transparency in terms of like, you know, people who have got the grant and how they've done it, you know, like we don't know who have done it, who's gotten the grant and we don't like, I just don't think that information is available to us. So there's not a community of practice. Is that what you're saying? Oh, from my end, that is the case. Oh, terrific. David, what would you um, say? Yeah, I tend to agree with uh, both um, Peter and Mund's comments, but I would go further in saying that, you know, SMEs and sole traders are probably the lifeblood of the country's economy. Absolutely. And we land up being the ones always taking all the risk. So what happens is we're the guys who sign our lives away to the banks, sign our lives away to everybody uh, in order to make our businesses happen and take all the risk. And the big corporations, basically, <laughs> they get on with it. And, uh, and it seems that the money seems to flow easier to them than it does flow to their SMEs. And also, the risk that you take with that or how onerous it is to actually make those applications, etc. I must say that the IMCRC has been a really good one for us uh, with Swinburne. Uh, you know, that, that helped us for sure. Um, and, and that one wasn't that difficult, but it is a lot of documentation and things that have to be filled out, even in those instances. But coming back to my point that um, if government really wants to help, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not exactly sure the numbers, but I think the numbers are yeah, bantered about so like 70% of the economy is run by the SMEs and sole traders, right? So when you, if, if you really want to help them grow their businesses, it would be much easier if you helped them with the financial ability to do so by taking a lot of the risk away from them because then people would be much more inclined to do that so if we're going to do what like this with industry 4.0 and people want to invest i mean the recent budget sounds good in the fact that you'll be able to write your assets off um, much quicker that's great and it will definitely be a, a big help to companies that are doing it but you actually need the money initially to make the investment right You've got to have the money to make the investment. So where do you start? Unless you have the capital to invest, then you can't do it. So my point here being is help get the capital to do the investment and then, okay, write it off. But the capital is required first off. So I think there should be a way that companies who look like they've really got good potential, it should be helped. I'm in the fortunate position. I've been doing it for a long time. So my business is able to do it. I'm talking for other companies who've got real opportunity out there that could grow the economy with manufacturing that um, I think government should be looking at the SMEs and helping SMEs and sole traders. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, Brad. I, sorry, can I just add a couple of things to what David said? Yeah, so, uh, sure, Peter. You touched on the corporation. I think the policy settings, it's a one size fits all. Corporations are big enough and ugly enough to look after themselves. The SMEs, we are a different animal, whether it's HR or all sorts of other things and also the risk management side of it. Yes, they can manage their risk a bit better and they're very good at shifting risk, by the way, too, down the supply chain. So something that they should consider is trying to cap that risk because a lot of tenders and, and larger contracts which give the opportunity to grow, people think, well, no, this is all too hard. If it goes pear-shaped, you could lose a lot. So you've got to try and cap the risk. But yeah, the, the corporations and the SMEs are different animals completely. So there needs to be different policy settings. Sorry, Beth, just one point yeah. to add. I just see someone asked a question about there. What is uh, Industry 4.0 going to do to, to employment? Actually, it's going to increase employment, mm. funnily enough, because what happens um, is that once you've got your business and your systems and processes up and running really well and your business becomes e efficient, you'll end up being able to employ more people because the opportunity for your business to grow is going to be there. And everything's still got to be run by people. The machinery has got to be run by people. The opportunity to expand your business internationally grows. So, but you've got to have your starting point. So actually, it, it, it won't... You know, although people say, oh, you'll put a robot, it'll take people's jobs away. Well, no, actually, you'll expand your horizons to grow your business further. And therefore, you will still need more people. You may go from one shift to two or even three shifts. So suddenly, you're going to need more people to run that machinery, if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, Brad, would you like to talk about how you think yeah, look, programs uh, could be improved? Yeah, look, I don't think I've got too much to, you know, different to say to... To what's already been said but there's there's absolutely there there are support mechanisms out there i will say there's the ai group there's you know you know and as peter had mentioned there's the southeast melbourne manufacturing group we have the bendigo manufacturing group um there, there are several of those groups out there for us regional 
regional development, Victoria has played a big part. So um, there are some conduits to get access to that information, there's absolutely no doubt. But but certainly the, the red tape that's associated with, with submitting applications um, sometimes makes it too hard. Um, I would suggest that there's, there's quite a few SMEs out there that are marginal businesses. Um, so, you know, uh, applying the resources to, to have these applications completed, you know, adequately is probably difficult. Um, but, but I also agree with you, there's definite opportunity to drive uh, employment. Yeah, and whether or not that's even redeployment of existing people. I know a lot of people, when we talk about lean and, and industry 4.0, it's all about, well, how do we reduce our labour costs? I think there needs to be a, a change in mindset. Of how do we redeploy those people into value-added positions? And um, I think being able to do that um, with through investment is, is key for those sort of businesses. Yeah, couldn't agree more, Brad. Fantastic. Phil, do you have anything you want to add here? Well, I have maybe a slightly different approach towards this. Look, mm -hmm. uh, everything in life to me is about relationships, you know, like Peter was mentioning before about customers. Well, customer, you make a sale to a customer because of relationship. Um, I feel that the federal government, both sides, Liberal and Labor, have been trying to get kickstart manufacturing for a, a long period of time. We decided to invest in establishing our relationship with Oz Industry and with Swinburne University, with the IMCRC. You know, you've got to put some effort into it. Sure, if there's a bit of paperwork that's needed, well, that's fine, but it's not just this grant you're applying for now, you're establishing a relationship. You know, you get a small grant, you uh, achieve success with that, the government feels more confident with you. Believe me, when the next grant comes up, you get a better, better reaction from the government. So my advice would be to hold the course um, that's very important. Use the networks, use NICO, use Swinburne, use the IMCIC. Most importantly, get to know Oz Industry. Don't go through a, an agent or somebody else. Knock on the door, go in and get to meet them. Find a case officer. That person, his job is to help you. So if you've got a good business plan and you know where you're going, have confidence to go and establish the relationships that will get the, uh, the money that's flowing back to you. So maybe a slightly different approach, but I feel that, um, you know, we need to start to move forward and start to have a vision about where this thing's going. And I feel that the government sometimes doesn't get a fair crack, particularly Oz industry for the amount of work they're trying to do to help us. Yeah, Philip, I, I think I would agree with a lot of what you've got to say. Like I've said, you know, we've got involved with IMCSC, which is obviously assisted by government, which has helped us move forward. So, you know, on that level, I agree. So I think part of what you're saying is definitely true. And that's now got us more motivated to do more on an ongoing basis. And yes, you're saying building those relationships does come out. You've got to make a start. You've got to take those steps. Yeah. And even if you fail, you'll learn something by failure. Oh, you know? for sure. I've made a lot of mistakes in my time. <laughs> we all have. Haven't we all? <laughs> Nico, did you want to add anything here before we go to questions? Nico, you're on mute. <laughs> Apologies, somebody has to do that once in a minute. Um, no, I think it's much more important for the other gentleman to, to help okay. me. So look, I'll, I'll just read out some of the questions we've got. So keep them rolling in, please. But I'll start with Michael Evan and Ev Edwards. And here's a question for you, Phil. Um, he says, you said that you started on the journey in 2002, a bit like painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Have you found that You've needed to continuously update and reinvest in digital technology across the factory to keep ahead of the technology wave. Well, uh, we're in business to manufacture stuff. So it's never, you know, all the time we're innovating, creating new ways of doing things. Uh, if you're making the same product um, uh, like that you were making five years ago, you're on the path to destruction. You know, we're always about constant innovation, constant change, constant change. And it's, I have to go public here. I had a huge row with Nico once on a panel where he, we, we were talking about digital strategies. And uh, I told him it was rubbish, is I think the words I used in public, which I apologize for publicly right. now. But, but um, uh, you know, I think maybe we're at the stage now where it's interesting because in the digital space, you know, there's a disconnect between 
the front end, you know, the office type, the ERP systems, all that sort of stuff, and the back end, you know, the operational things, all the data stuff. We've got just so much data flowing through. How do we bring these two things together? And uh, we found that there are times when we focus more on the business side and then that gets fixed and then we go back to the operation side then that gets fixed, we go back to the business mm -hmm. side. You know, it's always a great thing about it is that the um, uh, capability of the systems is improving dramatically and the cost is coming down. So, you know, just as I said, you know, you've got to get started. You've got to put your toe in the water. You've got to get moving because it's a great journey to be on. Fantastic. Anyone else want to add anything in here? Um, this is a question for Peter. Um, is the growing, and this is from Paul Dowling, is the growing issue of data security the biggest threat to Industry 4.0, Peter? Well, I think, I mean, data security is a problem at the best of times. Um, I think the bigger issue is that when people come and go and look, you know, no one's going to have a job forever and you know, people move on and they take the intellectual property with them or you know whether it's in their head or whatever that's probably a bigger risk than hackers from uh, from overseas in my view um but i don't know look i get even today i had a what looked like an invoice from a, a supplier and they actually emailed later saying please ignore this it's been hacked and you can sort of pick the pattern so that seems to be happening a lot but what we can do as manufacturers i'm not too sure it's really a um, a governmental thing, you know, or a, a worldwide issue that they've got to deal with. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not an IT expert, so I don't know what they can do to do that. I know, say, going back to when uh, video recorders first came in, once you give, you develop that technology to, to be able to record stuff and, and then copy it, well, then, of course, everyone has access to that. So it's no different to the hackers and things like that. So, yeah, there's no simple answer, unfortunately. Anyone else want to jump yeah. in on that question? Could I jump? Could I jump yeah, in? Absolutely. And it's just a just a little anecdote. So um, earlier early in the year, when we could still do that, I was visiting a business that we were working with and talking to to their CEO and walking across the manufacturing floor. And and he told me that two days prior to our visit, they had just recovered um, uh, from some cyber security issues. What had happened was one of their employees had brought in a USB stick that he used on the computer at home, put it into one of the office computers that USB stick was infected with ransomware. Mm -hmm. The ransomware then infected the office computer, spread over their <laughs> network onto all of their computers, including the ones that control their production equipment, mm -hmm. without two days worth of downtime for the whole factory. It took them two days to, to get their equipment back up and running. So it can be something as simple and as trivial as that. And if you think that two days of worth of downtime is an issue, then I think the answer to cyber security is an emphatic yes. Okay. Uh, Robert Colanzi has asked, all levels of government sit on a heap of data, so much they don't even know they have it or the quality. How can manufacturers access that data for te technical innovation, product design, etc.? Um, so I'm not Happy sure. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, yeah, they have huge, I mean, I don't know if they know what to do with the data. They, they tend to yeah. make poor policy from the data they do have access to, but I'm sure that, you know, people like us on the, uh, the panel here and others listening would be able to make more use of it, uh, particularly when it comes to supply chains and getting access into those supply chains. So one question that we've been asking at SEMA is, where do they actually spend their money? They want to, you know, boost manufacturing and, you know, jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the, that seems to be the mantra. Well, open up the, the supply chains. They probably don't know what they don't know. A lot of them don't really know what, what they're buying, where they're buying it from. And if they ask a simple question, well, where is this made? That, you know, that would be a huge boost to manufacturing. Now, if we're not good enough for price delivery service, whatever, that's another issue. At least we can learn from that. But we're not even getting onto the ballpark. So maybe that data could be used and certainly their procurement practices need to be yes. streamlined because at the moment every department has their own procurement practice. Uh, it's just, it is a dog's breakfast and you don't know who you're dealing with or how to get into those supply chains. Anyone else want to? Um, David, yes. did you want to? A, a, one of the things that Mond asked that in, in how you get information, it, it does help to belong to industry groups that you know yeah. your particular industry is involved in. And I, I, one of you guys mentioned the, the AI group. They're particularly good. Um, overall, um, they feed a lot of information out to you when it's happening, when you're members of that or your chamber of commerce. So you do get a lot of information from those groups and, and they do help you a lot. 
to understand what's going on um, in industry overall, or if you've got an industry specific, like there's the furniture industry, which we are members of. So I, I recommend that anybody, you know, with your particular industry does belong to those groups, because then you do hear about things happening or particular government assistance in your industry. Thank you, David. Now I've got a question here from Jill Joanna Car Cabardo, who said, what do you think should be the skill set and knowledge of human capital that in industry 4.0 would demand? Uh, this could help our students prepare for their skill set and knowledge for them to be equipped and qualified as potential human resources in SMEs. And Nico, did you want to answer that one? Yeah, I'm sure I can uh, have a crack at it. Um, the skill set that's going to become increasingly important um, are skills that have to do with with human skills the ability to creatively problem solve together the ability to learn and create through learning while working creating value the ability to uh, um, affect affect change and do change management and take people with you and the ability to co-elevate and co-create with people and the reason i'm saying that is we're seeing that increasingly um, you know task-based industries such as manufacturing tasks things that people carry out with their hands are yes starting to become increasingly um, increasingly automated and so there will be progressively less task-based work but there'll be more and more and more of that value adding work through collaboration co-creation um, co-elevation and so, so that number one Number two, we already know from most studies that a typical graduate now will, some, will have somewhere in the region between seven and 16 to 19 different jobs over the course of their career. Each time they change job, they will need to pivot on their skill set a little bit because each time to get the next job, they probably need to slightly alter the skill set. So really the ability to learn, the ability to become and the ability to understand how to build are going to become really important. Fantastic. And Anyone if I else? could just add, yeah, if I could yeah. just, um, you know, I guess expand on what Nico has just said, I, I think there's a, there's, there's a key gap at the moment in, in, you know, maybe that secondary and tertiary education space where unfortunately it appears as though words like manufacturing production um, have become dirty words. Um, and, and, I, I think the skill set that Nico has, has spoken about are absolutely critical. But the fact of the matter is they're skill sets that are not going to go into manufacturing things. And if if everyone thinks, you know, that, that the opportunities are going to be there, that, you know, they're going to be programming robots or um, working on computers or, or doing technical-based um, tasks, it's going to become very difficult to find suitable people for traditional manufacturing processes. All right. I've got a question here from David Painter. He's saying, well, we've talked a lot about the hard side of manufacturing, um, but do you think industry 4.0 is going to put more emphasis on the producer engaging directly with the customer and developing a relationship with the customer? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all it's all about the customer. <laughs> uh, well, so we, we sort of keep it all vertically integrated on our end. And a lot of the jobs that we're trying to do is more the creative side, right? Trying to design, play a bit more empathy with the customer and what they're wanting. And because we have so much insight for the last 20 years of doing custom furniture, we're trying to standardize all that in a way. And it means that if we can start designing it with mechanics as well as manufacturing in an easy way, we're building out scripts. So we're allowing the customer to actually design their furniture and we can build up that system for them. And I think that's something that we're leaning towards. So it's direct from the customer to the factory, which we find super um, interesting. Okay, look, I've got a question here from David Campbell. Uh, he says, so most comments about 4.0 really are smart manufacturing using data better. Um, what do the panelists think are the areas where Australia has a competitive or comparative advantage? Well, 
Oh, can I jump in there? Quickly? In the manufacturing area, in yes, the please manufacturing Phil. Area. Yeah, look, yeah. I, I think uh, we're really good at innovation. You're being creative. Uh, we're absolutely hopeless at transforming that innovation into global supply chains, into global markets. And, um, you know, but these just, just takes time to develop these skills. Um, so, um, I think it all boils down to the government has come out to say that they're committed to manufacturing, they want a value add. Uh, I, I'm taking that in, on uh, in good faith to think they're going to be there to support me. And so, you know, have a crack at the international market, have a crack at trying to export. That's where you really learn what's going on around the world. And I think you've got to have that sort of vision if you're going to be successful in manufacturing. You've got to be looking at the export market. And there's obviously quite a lot of export programs around. Sorry, David. I would add to that also that goods yep. coming out of Australia are seen as ethically sourced, that if they're going to have been manufactured ethically. So I think, you know, that's a very big plus. So obviously you've got to be able to manufacture them cost effectively, but international markets will buy them from Australia. So because they know they'll be manufactured ethically. So that is a competitive advantage. Intellectual. So just the other thing on that too is that yeah. I think our niche is that small volume, high compliance, high quality, you know, which adds on to David's point there that you know, that's what we've got to market ourselves on. You know, stuff coming in from overseas can be really trusted from certain parts of the world. You know, look at the cladding issue with the, the Docklands building, mm. things like that. So we do have that, as I said, we do have a good reputation around the world, but I think it's that small volume, that niche sort of marketing, that's where you get a lot of export opportunities from. So that leaves, leads on to the next question from Steve Lamard. Lamand, um, he's asked about intellectual property manufacturing. And when you talked about uh, quality and reputation, David, I was thinking here about trademarks um, being an important form of intellectual property. So um, do you think intellectual property is going to become more important in the future of manufacturing? I guess that's patents, trademarks, copyright, designs, registered designs. Are you asking me the question? I think uh, no more. Well, anyone really, but you look good. <laughs> I think it's, that's always been important. Um, yeah. you know, the world's become a much smaller place, no matter which you do it. But again, for SMEs, it's an expensive exercise. You know, you it's it's not cheap to go and register trademarks and also file patents all over the world. It's very very difficult. But you obviously got to you got to target your markets, know which markets you're going for and try and at least secure those as best that you can to protect your RP. But it's, it's not an easy one because it's an expensive exercise unless you've got the real, you know, if you're, unless you have the money to back it up. Yes, uh, I'd like to also add in there, this is a minefield um, and uh, very complex. So I don't think it's a simple answer. Um, the way which we've uh, patented a number of our products, but then we've had to, because of the cost associated with that uh, patent, we've had to assign those patents to global partners. Um, however, one thing we do maintain is the, uh, our, the, made, the way in which we make things, our machinery, we build custom lines. So we've got a, an enormous amount of um, industrial secrets that we don't tell anyone about. That's and, always the best RP. And, and <laughs> con constant innovation. By, so by the time they copy one of our products, it's already five years old and we're making something entirely new. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm not too sure that the patent system works globally. I think, you know, the trouble with writing out a patent, you've got to tell everybody what you do and how you do mm -hmm. it. And that's really yeah. dumb. You know? yeah. nice and then when you've got to defend it, the cost to defend it are so large that you might have spent oh, that yeah. in marketing. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, I'll just finish off on the last question from Antonio Belauga. It's a question for Phil. Um, what were the most challenging aspects of the first collaborations you did? And what, what advice do you have with, for other SMEs, Phil? This is collaboration with... Uh, well, with I know you, you collaborated early on with CSIRO, so, um, or, and Kimberly Clark, so both. You, yeah. you had the triple collaboration, really. Yeah. Well, look, we, um, I don't know how to answer that. Again, I think it's about relationships. Um, we, uh, when we started with CSIRO, it was a very difficult relationship. <clears throat> we were we were being, it's interesting though, we were being led by CSIRO. In other words, we were taking their solutions to problems and we were trying to implement and find a commercial solution for them. Now, everything is driven by a strategy, you know, so what do we want to do? Then we go out and find a partner that can work with us on that particular issue. 
and uh, then we uh, and we had we set strict guidelines and we worked through from there. Relationships, finding the right person. There's no point, you know, there's no point in wasting time if you don't have that personal connection with the person that you're working with. And uh, making sure that the business is leading the research, not the other way around. I think is the key thing. Fantastic. Well, look, we're right on five.